Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the increasing attacks against LGBTQ plus folks, and particularly trans folks across the United States, and especially across the American South, with special guest, Tim and West, Executive Director for the LGBTQ Plus Institute at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so good to be here, Mark. So I, let's just set this up because it's just insane what is happening. It seemed that for a long time, we were going toward greater and greater acceptance. I'm certainly old enough to know the time and have very, very stark memories going back into my own family of people being closeted in in very separated and an apartheid kind of way of having people, members of the LGBTQ plus community, having secret communities in a self-protected way. We had the Stonewall riots that, that was a rebellion against that type of suppression. And for a long, long time, um, we seem to have, have gone toward greater acceptance until we've had this recent blowback. What is your view of, of the trajectory of history and where we are now? It's really interesting that we are at this particular point. Uh, I joined the board, uh, the inaugural board of the LGBTQ Institute, which essentially is a little background. Uh, it builds a bridge between advocates and academics. So the idea of the Institute is to leverage things like research and history as a way of sort of building power in communities. Um, and when I joined the board, it was 2015. Uh, I think uh, President Obama was still in office. And if you had told me and our other board members uh, that eight years later, we would be where we are now, we would have been like, no, we thought we were moving direction around things like inclusion, um, you know, rights for people. Um, and I think there's just been in part uh, due to toxic rhetoric uh, and scapegoating people that seem the most vulnerable, right? Uh, it's interesting to me, Mark, that uh, there was bipartisan support for um, the Protect Marriage Act, right? Which, you know, protects marriage in our country uh, and so there's even an extent to which uh, cisgender queer people like myself are seen as kind of OK, but like we need someone that we can pick on and vilify. And right now, that's the trans and the non-binary community. Uh, and unfortunately, even some people in our community uh, have also uh, marginalized those groups of people. There, there's rhetoric out there saying that that community is really holding uh, gay and lesbian folks back as opposed to being more inclusive. And so our idea is to really just generate uh, more awareness about what's happening. The violence is picking up, uh, in particular among LGBTQ youth. Uh, rates of suicidality and depression are spiking. And in part, Mark, due to the rhetoric in the media, uh, you know, when you wake up and there's constantly uh, rhetoric on the news about uh, your identity not being valid or not being a real person, um, it's it's hurtful. And I think as I work, uh, the L the Institute is a project or a program of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. One of the things I think is really important about that is that I'm committed to resituating LGBTQ rights and trans rights as human rights. If we can agree that transgender people are human, then they are endowed particular rights uh, to access to health care, to education that others of us are. And, and, and I think the, the rhetoric is intending to dehumanize that category of people, to pathologize transgender people so that it makes it easier for people to sort of target and dismiss them. And I think that's, that's the travesty. And I think more than anything, um, allies, both straight and in the LGBTQ community, need to say, hey, I may not understand every particular aspect of a trans person, but they are a person, they are human, and they are endowed certain rights uh, to be able to live and thrive just like anybody else. Well, and and the, the standard of having to understand every particular aspect of a human being is ridiculous. I mean, I don't it understand <laughs> every particular aspect of myself, my wife, my kids. Come on. I mean, the fact is, is that I don't understand every particular right. aspect of you. 
right? But but we can chat and you can share part of who you are with me. The thing that the thing that dis, that really distresses me is that the tactics that are at play here mm-hmm. seem to be immortal tactics of of identifying the weakest members of a particular society. Yes. Absolutely. Um, then othering them and then uh, using language to create a dehumanized context. We saw this um, with slaves that mm-hmm. were in this country and creating a whole language set and a whole way of treatment and a whole um, system to create categorization that would create an otherness about them and therefore make it more acceptable, more socialized to treat people in that category who were black in a certain way. And we're seeing this now with the weakest, the smallest, the most marginalized uh, individuals. And I think that we can actually look at ourselves and see just on a human level is that really how we want to treat, even if we don't understand someone? Right. Is that really how we want to treat someone who could be our child, our son, our daughter, our our uncle, our, you know, I mean, these are people who we ought to try to understand. If Absolutely. Different, right? You and I should be trying to understand each other. Shouldn't we try Absolutely. to understand someone who, has a different orientation or identity than me. Absolutely. And, and, and what's interesting is a lot of this hinges on this uh, this new sort of parent right stuff, right? Like that we we want right uh, parents to have rights. One, there's a kind of essentialization of the category of parent, as if all parents believe the same things about how they want to raise kids. So we talk about banning books because they're not good for kids. But like, which parents are we talking about? Uh, my mom let me loose at the library and said, go read, go forth and read. Right. (laughs) And I got to have critical engagement with texts that resonated with me and didn't resonate with me. And I think that that's a part of our intellectual uh, and psychological development as, 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 as people in this country to have access to that. Uh, The banning is saying um, that there's one group of parents that we're going to privilege Right. As uh, as the right ones and any parent that doesn't agree with this particular way, then therefore loses their rights. I think that's the dangerous thing that's happening in places like Florida right now, where, you know, everything from books being censored and banned to certain types of curriculum. Um, and so it really it speaks to a, a real hypocrisy. So uh, I think you it are also a bit of a libertarian to- or you are basically live and let live, let different parents have different parenting styles and and not try to impose my parenting style on you, right? I think it's very dangerous, right? I think it is, it's a really dangerous slippery slope to start to legislate how parents can raise their kids. So on one side, you have people that say, you know what, supporting a trans kid is actually abuse. And there's actually evidence of legislation that's trying to get passed that would actually criminalize parents for saying, you know what, uh, my kid is gender non-binary or that they feel like they were born in the wrong body. And I want to actually support them by taking them through uh, vetted <laughs> medical uh, and psychologically appropriate care to get those conversations, to get the care that they need. There's vast evidence the evidence out there that when children who are in that space uh, and adults alike uh, receive that care that they uh, that they are happier that they thrive um, and yet uh, there are people that will call that abuse uh, on the other side you have people that say you know what if you kick your trans kid out uh, because they are trans or non-binary or LGBTQ then that's abuse right um, now I certainly have my own opinion about that but I, I appreciate a world that we can live in where people get to have the conversation without being criminalized because they believe a particular thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm i with you. You know, we work for a whole bunch of different people and not everybody has the exact same values that I particularly have or that any of our people particularly have, nor do all of our staff have one set of values. We have different folks from different backgrounds and so on. This idea of we're bound together by people who are trying to improve civil society 
and mm-hmm. give each other space. That's basically what you're saying is that instead of legislating, creating one set of rules that all of a sudden create a state coercion on parents or a state coercion on individuals, let's give people space to, to just be and, and figure it out for themselves rather than do it through a network of laws, right? And, and I think importantly, there is a piece of this, right? And this is where the research becomes very important to me. There's kind of this movement aligned with some of the toxic rhetoric that is like, throw science out, right? Like that people get to spew and make cases for arguments that are like either based on really bad research or like research from maybe some kind of evangelical fundamentalist Christian uh, think tank, right? As opposed to like, the American Psychological Association or the American uh, Pediatrics Association. You have these these really strong vetted institutions that have done the research to say like this is healthy uh, and that that people have done a lot of work to get to that point. And yet you have these mythologies often spread through things like uh, social media that a lot of people are latching on to. Trans kids aren't being mutilated uh, at two and three years old or four and five years old. There's a process uh, that they have to go through, which includes psychological evaluation, getting to an appropriate age to even take something like uh, hormone blockers, which would simply delay uh, the uh, the the, um, ad- uh, the the process of maturing into uh, the gender uh, at at birth. And so, I think there's just a lot of information that has to be shared uh, out there. Uh, one of the data points in our recent uh, LGBTQ Southern survey, and you know, a lot of our work focuses on the South because one, contrary to what a lot of people lead, uh, know, about a third of the 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 U.S. LGBTQ population resides in the South. Uh, and when we think about the LGBTQ population, San Francisco, the Bay Area, we think about New York, maybe Chicago, uh, these, these areas. But like when you think about the fact that like a very substantial population of people who are LGBTQ live in the South, and yet that is where uh, the bulk of the legislation that's not only being proposed, but passing. Uh, I'm right here in the state of Georgia and gender affirming care is banned, right? So you do have families that have the privilege of saying, you know what, we're gonna move to another state that's more progressive where we can continue to care for our child. But I've I said a few times, that's a luxury that many or most families can't afford to just, we're gonna go to another state. Uh, and my fear is that families will have to resort to uh, underground methods, to things that may not actually be healthy to try to navigate those spaces and take care of their children, which is why I think that this is really, really important issues and work and that we need to do a lot to educate people, um, you know, who maybe don't understand on like, you know, what what does it mean to be trans or non-binary? But I think fundamentally, what does it mean to, to, to preserve and fight for and maintain um, families' rights and children's right to sort of live and thrive just like other people? What do you think the role of government is? I've always been a, hmm. been a small government guy where, where I thought, okay, government should basically have the, the lowest, we should have the smallest government we could possibly afford. We should have the least interventionist government that we can possibly afford. And government's role is things like assuring common defense, setting standards for the nation, you know, keeping people safe, making sure that minorities have um, have voice and and that the majority doesn't bigfoot minorities and so on. Mm-hmm. What is your view of uh, of what this role is? Because we do have, I mean, this is a government issue, right? These policies, these laws, and so on, trying to legislate what I can do, uh, you know, in terms of with my family or whatever, can or cannot do. What, what what's your view? And, you know, it's, it, it really exposes the a hypocrisy of a group of people that, you know, just a few years ago, we're talking about, like, we don't want the government in our lives. Right. Uh, and yet you see this turn where, like, it's OK for the government to be in the lives of people as long as it agrees with my values. Right. And so I think that's that's the real hypocrisy. But I think, you know, I'm probably aligned with what you say. I think that there are spaces uh, where the government needs to step in to, to legislate and ensure. Uh, don't, as you put, get bigfooted by the the majority. We we, we know, for example, that's been the real importance uh, of of a Supreme Court that can ideally uh, function and legislate in a way that's like 
uh, best, right? We know that like if we if if the if the ending slavery was put up to a, a, a democratic vote or a vote of the people, it probably wouldn't have happened. Such as the right for women to vote, such as marriage equality. So we need those governmental institutions that are operating and functioning uh, aligned with ethics to create those things. But I, I think it can be really dangerous when you have districts, states that are all of a sudden putting things up to a vote that actually legislate how people get to live their lives. Uh, and I think that's an overreach of government. Uh, but I think it's also a hypocrisy because, again, those same people uh, just a few years ago were, were saying that we don't want the government involved. Uh, but it seems like the reality is we want the government involved as long as it aligns with my way of life. And to me, that's a that's a a, a travesty and a real red flag going forward uh, because it can seep into other areas beyond just LGBTQ rights, right? And I think that's what I need people to understand is that, you know, if this, if people start to find a way to legislate how we get to live our lives or what we get to believe or where we get to go, uh, it will, it will some, at some point come to affect some decision that you uh, believe you should have the right to make. Um, and, and I think that's why it's, it's really the principle, like not so much that I'm getting away from the trans issue, but I think it's bigger than that. Because well, you it's, said it's, it before, right? What, if I go to a library, what books can I read? I mean, that is pretty darn fundamental, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that's about freedom of speech and so on. So as soon as you get to book bannings, um, you, right. you have, you, you have an issue, and then you can go into sort of religious you know, definition of what a religion is and, and what the right religion is and whether we have state sponsorship of religion. There are all these different practices that we've had debated since the founding of our nation. But I'd like to get to another point that you made, Timothy, sure. and that is the whole issue of, of children growing up, right? Mm -hmm. I know in my own family right? Our kids are very susceptible to um, to what's going on, the chatter and the culture and so on. And and that's good, right? I, I was in my day susceptible to that. And my parents said, oh, that's probably just a fad, right? So there are, as, as children grow up, they're not necessarily equipped at all points to know their own minds and they change back and forth. And us parents are trying to sort of figure out and provide guidance and also be respectful and so on. How does that actually work when you're talking about somebody who is, and we all do that, we all deal with our own gender, our own sexual identity, or all mm -hmm. place in the world. How does that work? Um, it, it seems to me that what's going on is that we've got people who are judging what other people of what other families ought to how, how they ought to navigate. And I don't know that that that's that's really appropriate here. Um, but we also don't want, you know, kids to self-define their own journey without any guidance. Right. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's that's where people are taking the rhetoric and saying it's letting kids just do what they want. I don't I don't agree with that as a parent, as someone that, that's raised a kid. I don't I don't agree with that. But I think to punit to punish parents for wanting to be supportive of that journey, allowing kids to go through a, an, an evolutionary process where they actually do have the support and know that they are supported. But interestingly, when we talk about our LGBTQ Southern survey, we actually found out some really interesting things. 22.5 of our respondents reported being under 10 years old when they first felt that they were LGBTQ. And that's really interesting. People will say, uh, so I'll 20, hear from 22 percent. You said 22 percent, 22 percent of our survey respondents said. Okay. And, and that that aligns with my experience. Like I had feelings that like I could grow up and I could love a man. I could grow up and I could love a woman like that was not a, a bizarre thought. Uh, and then we see that that number jumps uh, radically. Um, so by the age people are 14, 58.1. So almost 60 percent of people that currently identifies LGBTQ had those feelings. Now the question becomes So that's 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 puberty, right? I mean that's okay right. through that, right? I I, I <laughs> all of us, right, at, at a certain point we're we're sort of discovering ourselves sexually. So absolutely but but but, but here's the thing, Mark. Uh when did you realize you were a boy? At what age did you feel like I'm a boy, this is my gender, this is what feels right for me? I guess, I, I guess, uh, I don't know, uh, 
five, six, you know, I, I, be, before that, you just, you, you don't really think in those terms, right? Right. Uh, but I guess the, the, the point is like, I, I certainly understood my gender by the time I was 10, 12, like it's, I'm, I'm yeah. comfortable, I'm a boy, right? And so there's a, there's this double speak with like, you know, it's okay for some people to understand or, or even that, you know, we talk about, I was watching this, this video that went viral of this five-year-old kid uh, taking flowers to this little girl, five-year-old girl's house and the parents followed them. And it's like, oh, like he's going to be such a gentleman and look at how, you know, how chivalrous this is. And this is amazing. And there were thousands of uh, thousands of comments about a five-year-old boy taking flowers to a five-year-old girl's house. But we don't call that grooming, right? We don't say they're being groomed to be heterosexuals. So th there's, a, there's, again, a kind of double speak <laughs> around like people being aware. And I, 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 I'm not even gonna say that a five-year-old kid can't have aspirations to someday be with a girl, but it's problematic if the five-year-old kid feels like, oh, I might have a little crush on a boy. And then we say, that's not possible. You can't possibly know what you like. You can't possibly know your gender identity. So we have to have real genuine and non-hypocritical conversations around development of children when they come to know things. I think the important thing about that data point, which kind of hits on our access to books and literature and the censorship that's happening now, is if 58% of LGBTQ adults knew who they were before the age of 14, then it's not like they're being groomed. It's that they want to see themselves reflected. They don't want to feel like a unicorn or some kind of weird person because- like it's like exactly. Me, right? I want to say, oh, like that age, right? Right, and I think you know, for for heterosexual kids or for kids that are cisgender, like they get examples of people that they can model their lives off of, and and essentially we're saying you can't be that because we're going to deny you the ability to see sort of a healthy example of what you could be in the future. And I think that's dangerous. That's what leads to the suicidality, to the depression among youth. Is that the avenues that we had just a few years ago for supporting young people around that journey, even if they do turn 20 and change their mind, at least they feel like, you know what, I was supported in that journey. There is no harm in saying, wow, my parents supported me. I hadn't figured it all out, but I never once questioned if I'd be kicked out, if I would get get bashed or beaten or, or anything harmful happened to me because I'm literally just going through a developmental journey. Well, you know, it, it, it's really interesting. I was just the other day. I I, I was just at a at a church, mm -hmm. um, and it was a big a big um, sign out front. Uh, God, the original they them, right? Um, <laughs> which which I thought was was great. Now we also do a lot of work for people who have different beliefs in in that way. What you're mm -hmm. basically saying is. Give room for families, give room for churches, give room for civil society organizations to work it out rather than rather than legislating. So how do we help that along? Because, you know, one of the things that that I don't want to end up with is these pendulum swings in which we're legislating, you know, because of legislation that goes in one direction, that we legislate in the counter direction and force anything on anyone, right? We, we basically want to have a an open civil society uh, in which we can kind of work it out rather than a legislative uh, legislated um, society, which sort of starts to resemble, you know, a top down mind control kind of a kind of a regimen. How do we get there? Because that's part of what you're doing, Tim. What are you doing yeah. to create that circumstance where we can get back to more of a dialogue where, right? you know, we have a balance? You so said we don't have two echo chambers screaming at each other that don't yeah. can't have, a, can't have conversation. Yeah, I really, I really feel like that's where we need to get. I'm right now um, in the process of launching a youth advocacy fellowship where we're training young people between the ages of 16 and 30, um, like how to engage in conversations with people that believe very differently than you do. Uh, there's a there's a, a a mentor that I have great respect for, David Fleischer. Uh, he's out of uh, Los Angeles and he has this concept called deep canvassing. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's really a methodology around canvassing uh, in communities and, the, and to people that don't believe what you do. Uh, but it's rooted in a very interesting principle, which is around finding the points of connection before you actually delve into what you disagree on. And so it's a real strategy that people can be trained in. 
Um, you know, when I'm down south or in Arkansas, which is where I grew up, you know, the common conversations may be the fact that, you know, I was president of Future Farmers of America and then people kind of light up and we're talking about FFA. Right. Um, so then when I identify as queer, well, that person and, and research has shown this is more likely to listen to me and hear me out because I started with something that we have in common. I think the echo chambers exist because people's identities are rooted in particular ideologies of what they believe. And it's this ideological war happening instead of, oh, you're a dad and I'm a dad, too. Let's start there. Um to create a means for having a conversation. I think that's one thing, that's, I don't know if it's NPR, it's like one small step or story or uh, that show where they actually take two people who vote or believe differently, but they're both ministers or they're both teachers. And they find that when people have something in common, that they're able to have more civil dialogue. And there's a respect for like that profession because there is that alignment. I think, how can we, how can we take that example and begin to engage? Because what I'm seeing is like red states and blue states, right? Yeah, it's, and, just, and, it's just nonsense. And from it? your perspective, Mark, I would I would have issues if California, for example, which is often seen as like, you know, the, the, the that's the state that people tell folk in Georgia to go send their kids, go to California if you want to raise your kids that way. But I also would have an issue uh, telling a, a family or a parent that like you can't teach your kids uh, that, you know, that being LGBTQ is is against your religion. I think they deserve the right to also build those boundaries and ethics as long as it's not doing physical harm to a kid. And we know that there, there's some people that think that hey, psychological harm is happening, but we have to be in a space where people can believe different things because I certainly want the ability to raise my kid with a set of beliefs. And again, I like what you said. What does it mean to create a kind of civil society where people get to work through and work out these differences that we have in opinions? And I think the dangerous thing about now is we're saying, if this is not what you believe, then you don't get to be here, right? Uh, what is it, Florida, where woke goes to die? Or, you know, or, uh, I think it was um, at a university, or I think it was DeSantis that said something to the effect of, well, we don't do that DEI stuff here. Uh, if you want to do that, go somewhere else. Um, that's that's really dangerous, right? And and what if that that state mentality uh, started to spread to the point where people were told, well, you don't need to be in America if you have a certain set of beliefs. When I think fundamentally that our democracy is really about creating a space where we do get to have different opinions and thoughts about things, uh, and that the people that want to support and be nurturing the LGBTQ uh, students and kids and even adults uh, get to do so. There are some states, uh, Mark that are actually banning trans affirming care for adults, right? Not just kids. So like this whole thing of protect the kids, it's not about protecting the kids. It's about, I believe that they're only binary male and female and anybody that doesn't believe that doesn't deserve to exist. That's really dangerous because at some point that issue is gonna knock on something that you fundamentally cherish uh, as a right that you have. Uh, and I think that's where we all have to come together. I think that's where the alignment and the mobilization, even people that don't understand fully about the trans issue, to, to really take hold of the, the idea of we want to live in a democracy where people get to disagree with what most people think. Uh, and I think that that's, um, that's something that I'm certainly reminded of. And certainly I hope our listeners today are thinking about. I think part of what we need to do, Tillon, is to um, make sure that everybody feels and understands that there's a self-interest in the world that you're to, you're describing, as opposed to this world of circle the wagons. You know, if if I'm doing something as pedestrian as doing business with you, maybe you know I'm buying a sandwich at a place that you own, right? You want to make sure that that sandwich is good. Mm -hmm. Not a terrible sandwich that's cheap, but you want me to come back and buy another sandwich from you. Absolutely. So you have to care about how I feel. That's how you end up being prosperous. And yes. it's not true for the country. I have to care how you feel, even if you're different, even if you have a different, maybe you like salami and I like pastrami or, or you know, I like, <laughs> God knows, you know, ham on whole wheat with, with mustard, right? You're going to serve me something that I like. I know that that seems very pedestrian. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great analogy, Mark. Being considerate it's, it's of It's saying like, 
we're going to take ham off the menu because I think ham is bad for everybody. So you don't get you don't get access to that. And I think that's a real it's a really good metaphor and a really good analogy of like where we're moving in terms of a lot of this legislation and anti-trans stuff. It's really uh, creating uh, a lack of choice, right? The, a lack of agency that people have to design a life that that works for them and that leads to their prosperity. So, Tim, and thank you so much for for uh, guiding us through this discussion. Let's do this again. Let's um, absolutely more absolutely. of a light on on your programs with some of your youth. Absolutely. And I would uh, love to introduce you to some of the young people. You know, I go through the center and I see the Center for Civil Human Rights. You see a 19 year old uh, John Lewis. Uh, and I kept saying, like, what does it mean that like. John Lewis and, and and the people were being trained on like how to be advocates. And so I was like, we got to bring young people into the center and begin to teach and train them around how to have. And, and mind you, the Gen Zers are like, oh, this is what I believe. And I'm like, but you have to be able to have dialogue with the, the with the boomers and the Gen Xers that don't that think that there are too many acronyms in the LGBTQ LMNOP. Right. <laughs> and they want to just and they want to dismiss that. What does it mean to have a conversation? Are older LGBTQ uh, people that don't understand the use of queer because when they were coming up, being called a queer meant it was going to be followed by violence. So I think uh, how do we engage in those conversations to create a sense of respect uh, for for difference? And I think that's important. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk here. Well, great. Tim and West, Executive Director of the LGBTQ Institute at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. In Atlanta, thank you for your thank leadership. You. Thank you. Thank your boards. Thank your fellow staff members. Thank your donors. Thank your communities. And thank your youth. Thank you so much. Thank you.